G'day, um, my name is Royce Bister and I lead on conventional arms transfer controls for Safer World. My job today is to talk about the uh, Arms Trade Treaty implementation. Now, time's short, so I'm going to assume that you uh, have some familiar familiarity with the Arms Trade Treaty already and that you understand the, the hopes that the Control Arms campaign has for the humanitarian benefits that uh, a, a good treaty will be able to deliver. So I'll go straight in to talk about the implementation bit of, of the treaty. Um, you can see implementation as one side of a th of the three-sided ATT triangle. Uh, the other sides being the scope, so what will the treaty cover, and the criteria, which is what are the rules that will be applied to uh, uh, that need to be applied when you're making states are making decisions about whether to, to transfer or not. Now. Um, all three sides of this triangle matter. You can have comprehensive scope, you can have um, uh, rigorous criteria, but if you, if you don't have the robust mechanisms and systems and procedures uh, for how to make these things actually work in practice, then it's all just words on paper. The first thing to consider is that the implementation will, still, will, will be mainly at the national level. States themselves will be responsible for making decisions about whether to transfer and for enforcing those decisions just as they are now without the arms trade treaty. There will be no overarching transnational body that's telling states what to do. And regardless of whether you would like to see that kind of overarching international body, um, it's just not happening. There's no serious interest among states for anything like this. So in that respect, it's business as usual. In which case, you might be asking, what's the point? Well, there will be a difference. A, a dif one difference is that states will have agreed the, the, um, to follow certain processes and to apply the same standards and rules in this, in this area, which is not the case at the moment. And then, I think if you add a few more things on top of that, which we'll come to later, um, then this can make a real difference. Um, now, so at the national level, states will need to put in place the laws and the regulations and the administrative systems so that they can do what the treaty requires of them. So, for example, they'll need a, um, a licensing system, a licensing authority. They'll, so they'll need to be able to uh, have the systems in place to make assessments of requests, uh, of the risks of the, when, when people request to transfer arms. They need to um, have a list of the items and the activities and the transactions that are actually subject to control. Uh, they need to give themselves the authority and the capability to enforce the controls. They need mechanisms and, um, uh, for international cooperation and assistance, um, and they need data, man data management capability. This is for internal record keeping um, and, crucially, for external reporting purposes. Now, when I say crucially, I mean crucially. The treaty must oblige states to report publicly on how they're implementing the treaty in terms of their systems and procedures and on to, to publicly report on all international transfers that they're involved with, international arms transfers they're involved with. Because if states are making the decisions themselves, um, which will be the case, and if they're then able to do this in secret, well, I, um, to me, the consequences of that are, are obvious. So the ATT must oblige states to publish information about, um, uh, about laws, uh, the regulations, their systems, their procedures, and then on an annual basis about all of the international arms transfers that they are involved with under the treaty. Now, on top of that, the treaty has to provide for a forum where states can, uh, can meet to exchange information and discuss their progress on treaty implementation and to discuss, discuss and resolve issues around particular transfer decisions. So this combination of transparency and then accountability uh, can create the well, it creates the opportunity for states to, to question and challenge each other, and, and indeed it, it legitimises this approach, which is very important. And without it, I think the potential to deliver real change is seriously compromised. On the uh, on the plus side, the idea of this kind of forum is relatively uncontroversial. So it's highly likely, yes, we'll end up with uh, annual assemblies or meetings of states' parties that will fulfil this function. Public reporting, that's trickier. Some states have a blanket opposition to the concept of 
public reporting, on, uh, especially on transfers. Um, others have uh, kind of niche areas where they would, uh, they don't have an opposition in principle, but they have an opposition over specific issues where they would prefer privacy to publicity. Now, to my mind, these arguments for, for privacy or for secrecy don't stack up, and we can discuss that more in the web chat later. But this issue is too important to the effectiveness of the whole project to be put to one side. But moving on, um, we also need uh, uh, opportunity for uh, review or amendment of the treaty as time goes on. I mean, the trade itself evolves, and the treaty will need to keep pace with that evolution. Um, again, I don't think this is particularly problematic. We'd expect to see some kind of uh, five, five yearly review conference cycle. Effective implementation will also require, I think, some kind of dedicated institution, such as an implementation support unit, an ISU, to assist in the day-to-day -day management and running of the, of the, of the treaty. Um, for example, by supporting the reporting function, by helping to identify gaps that exist in national systems, um, serving as a clearinghouse in terms of uh, bringing together states that require assistance and states that can provide it. Um, promoting universalization of the treaty among non-state parties. Now most states acknowledge the need for an ISU, but many say, oh, it's got to be small, got to be small, got to be small. Now, I'm wary of this. Okay, fine. Yes, we want a lean, mean, efficient fighting ISU machine, but we need to start with the function that we want, the functions that we want the ISU to serve, and then determine the size on that basis and not vice versa. Probably need some kind of, well we will need some kind of dispute management processes. Uh, we'd expect, and I'm sure this will be the case, we expect states would, uh, if they've got issues, they'll first discuss those among themselves or between, between each other. Um, but if they find it impossible to resolve those, uh, uh, any dispute, then you need to think about uh, dispute settlement procedures. This could be enlisting the good offices of the UN Secretary General, it could be referring the matter to an external body such as the International Court of Justice, but um, it has to be said that uh, the states are very cautious about this kind of thing. Finally, um, the capacity issue. As many states are just simply afraid that they won't be able to meet the obligations that uh, being a party to the treaty may involve, uh, and this is a very legitimate concern for smaller, less capacitated states, but there are ways to respond to this. Now, first of all, there's the issue uh, of flexibility of design. Um, the Amstrad Treaty um, shouldn't expect um, all states to have exactly the same systems in place. It's not a one-size-fits-all operation. It make no sense for Tuvalu, for example, to have the same uh, system as the US. So it needs to be sensitive to the needs and capacities of individual states. And the other is in terms of assistance. States that can provide assistance need to step up and provide, assist, provide that assistance where it is needed. All right, that's, um, that's a very brief look at a involved, diverse subject. Um, at the start, I spoke of the ATT as a triangle. Um, I think you can also see it as a, like a three-legged stool. Um, and the, the legs being scope, criteria, implementation. Now you knock away any one of those legs and bang, the whole thing uh, collapses. It would be a mistake to think that by looking after scope and criteria that implementation will look after itself. I'll leave it there. Uh, thanks for sticking with me and um, I look forward to answering any questions that you might have.